This sermon is largely a collection of quotes and paraphrases from the, stitched together from the brilliant work of Father Paul Gardner, S.J. In January of 1842, an auburn-haired baby girl was born in Melbourne, Victoria, and it was a British colony in Australia. Her parents, both Scottish Highlanders who'd recently immigrated, named her the first of their eight children, Maria Ellen McKillop. Although she never attended any real high-class school, she was nonetheless a very well-educated woman. It was because of her father, who was a very highly educated man, and he used his talents to, to train his daughter. Although he was a brilliant man, he was not a particularly good provider. A most remarkable example of his improvident behavior occurred when his father decided to help a dying friend fulfill his last wish to see Scotland before he died. That meant leaving behind his wife, for 17 months, with then six little kids, the oldest of which was Mary at that time, who was nine years old. Now, how is food supposed to be put on the table during the, that whole period of time? Not only that, but unbeknownst to his poor wife, not only did he leave her there alone while he went off to Scotland, he mortgaged his property to their brother in order to pay for the trip. It gets worse. Since he's away for longer than the terms of the mortgage, his very own brother foreclosed on the property, And even though Mary's mother quickly got money from friends, her brother-in-law refused the money and kept the house and the property. When one of Mary's maternal uncles heard about the situation, he gathered up his sister and the children and brought them to his farm. Mary summarized the youth, quote, My life as a child was one of sorrow. My home, when I had it, a most unhappy one. Close quote. The long and short of it is Mary wound up working various jobs to support the family, finally landing a job at the age of 18 in Panola, South Australia, working as a governess for her aunt and uncle. Not only did she care for and teach her ten cousins, she also taught the other children on the farm. As divine providence would have it, the local parish priest, Father Julian Tennyson Woods, kind of an eccentric Englishman, he had spent time with the Passionists in England and the Marists in in France before he was finally ordained for the Diocese of Adelaide in Australia in 1857, Father Woods was very concerned about the lack of education and almost perfect ignorance of the faith among so many of the children in the outback, where it was so tough for the parents to just get by and make a living that they had very little time to worry about educating their children. Mary tells what happens next, quote, I heard the pastor from the altar speak of the neglected state of the children of his parish, and I had to go and offer myself to aid him as far as the nature of my other duties would permit. Close quote. In 1866, Father Woods, by that time it had been appointed the diocesan director of education, invited Mary and two of her sisters to open a school in Panola. One of their brothers renovated a stable for them. In this humble schoolhouse, they began teaching more than 50 kids. In June 1867, having moved to Adelaide, she took the religious habit on August 15th she made her first vows and received the name Sister Mary of the Cross, thus becoming the first sister and superior, the first order to be founded by Australians. It's called the Sisters of St. Joseph of the Sacred Heart, the Josephites, and they were dedicated uh, to the education of the children of the poor. Their rule was composed by Father Woods and approved by the Bishop of Adelaide. It emphasized radical poverty, the idea that the sisters would go anywhere they were needed, no matter how poor the circumstances, and how a deep faith that God would provide for their needs. By the end of 1869, more than 70 sisters were educating tw- children at 21 schools in Adelaide in the country, besides doing other charitable works for the poor, which are too long to list, but for example, running an orphanage, taking care of troubled girls, and so forth. By the end of that year, they expanded into Queensland. Now, on the way there, Sister Mary stopped in Sydney and ran into some Benedictine nuns who spoke to her about the significance of her religious name. Sister Mary wrote to her mother, quote, My title, the happy one given me at my profession, implies a life of crosses and afflictions. Close quote. Now that's a prophecy. Meanwhile, back in South Australia, the sisters who were left behind there reported to Father Woods that an Irish Franciscan priest was guilty of drunkenness and the kind of behavior we now associate with Boston. The priest was sent away. One result of which, his friend and fellow Irish Franciscan, Father Charles Horn, became a sworn mortal enemy of Father Woods and the sisters. By the time the bishop, 
Another Irish Franciscan named Lawrence Scheele returned to Adelaide after his 17-month absence. He was gone to the First Vatican Council, a long ways away, no way to keep in contact. By the time he came back, there were 127 Josephite sisters working his diocese, running 34 schools, and that's not including those like Sister Mary, who are now working in Queensland. All this in a scant five years from their humble beginnings in a stable turned into a schoolhouse. Father Horn, who is still furious over the banishment of his scandalous priest friend, became the acting vicar general of the diocese and the constant companion and advisor of the bishop. It was no secret that he was determined to destroy both Father Woods and the sisters in revenge for the expulsion of his friend. Now, the bishop himself was quite sick, and as his health deteriorated, he came more strongly under Horn's influence. According to the deposition of a Jesuit priest familiar with the situation, for about two years, the bishop had been fine when dealing with ordinary duties, but whenever he asked him something complex or important, he'd get so confused that whatever the first thing was proposed, that would, he'd seize on that. At his side during this very time was Father Horn. Quote, Father Horn was his constant guide and companion. But what is worse, he kept the bishop, who was like a little boy, in a torpid state, bringing him brandy mixed with water because of his ill health and stomach weakness. But this made his stomach, as well as his mind, weaker, and is thought to have accelerated his death. Close quote. So with that as background, with absolutely no warning, the bishop suddenly announced changes to completely change the spirit and the rule of the Josephite congregation. All the postulants, that's all the girls that have come there, are supposed to be dismissed, and each convent was all of a sudden supposed to be put under the control of the local priest. One of the sisters quite rightly pointed out that they had taken a vow to obey the existing rule. When the bishop replied that anyone who had a problem with his changes would be dismissed from the vow, one of the sisters made the reasonable request, well, could we at least see the new rule so we know what it is that you want us to do? And he just dismissed that as a female whim. Sister Mary of the Cross, who at this time had returned to South Australia, wrote the bishop, quote, a firm and clear letter, taking care to express her respect for his authority and her dependence on him. She declared that he had every right to change the rule, just as he had approved it in the first place. She outlined the development of her own religious vocation and concluded that should the rule be changed in the manner he had indicated, she would choose not to remain in the Institute, but to look for an opportunity to live the rule elsewhere. Close quote. As she said, quote, my first duty was to God and to the rule, which for his sake I had vowed to follow, no matter what obstacles might be thrown in its way. Close quote. In the evening of September, Thursday, September 21st, Father Horn ordered Sister Mary to catch the first train the next morning to a town some 50 miles away. Now, she said she would leave, but she asked to see the bishop before she left so that she could see these proposed changes to the rule, because if they were serious enough, she wasn't going to consent to them. She was going to find someplace else to live out her vocation. Father Warren told her that the bishop would see her the next morning, so she went to bed, tired and sick. At about 10.30 at night, Father Horn returns to the convent. This is an interesting time for a priest to show up at a convent. And tells the sister who answered the door that if Sister Mary did not comply with the bishop's wishes to leave town on the first train, she'd be excommunicated. The sister brought the message to Sister Mary in bed, who replied she could not but act as she had done. She did not refuse to leave town, but she wanted to see the bishop first before she left. The response was relayed to Father Horn, along with information that none of the sisters in the convent were willing to accept another rule. The next morning, the bishop, accompanied by four priests, arrived at the convent and ordered Sister Mary to be summoned. He was told she was not well and was only then getting up. Meanwhile, the nuns from the other house had come to the convent. When Sister Mary entered the room, she knelt for the bishop's blessing, but he refused to bless her. They then moved to the chapel, where the bishop... With, complete with mitre and crozier, said he had to excommunicate Sister Mary because of her disobedience and rebellion. The sentence was then pronounced by the bishop, together with some remarks on spiritual pride and the wickedness of the world that Mary MacKillop had brought into the convent with her. He said that anyone who communicated with her would suffer the same penalty. He's acting in total disregard for the formalities required by law. But here's how Sister Mary felt. Quote, I really felt like one in the dream. I seem not to realize the presence of the bishop and the priests. I know I did not see them, but I felt, oh, such a love for their office. A love. A sort of reverence for the very sentence which then I knew was being passed in full force upon me. 
I do not know how to describe the feeling, but I was intensely happy and felt nearer to God than I had ever felt before. The sensation of the calm, beautiful presence of God I shall never forget. Close quote. One of Sister Mary's Jesuit advisors stated that apart from the faction of priests who followed Father Horan, everyone else considered the sentence to be completely invalid. On her part, Sister Mary viewed the trouble as something permitted by God and that it was a privilege for one as unworthy as her to suffer for our Lord. Quote, I must try at least not to abuse God's love by speaking ill of or making known the faults of his servants. Close quote. But she saw that, quote, bishops and priests have an awful power and terrible in the sight of God must it be if that be abused. Close quote. She's perfectly disposed to forgive everyone who had injured her, and she actually felt worse about the loss of reputation of her bishop than she did about her treatment at his hands. She shielded the bishop as far as possible from any blame. And when you read her writing, she said stuff like, he's been misled, he's confused and perplexed, he sometimes contradicts what he said a moment before. Five months later, the bishop, then dying, lifted the censure on Sister Mary. She told her mother that he admitted he had acted unjustly toward herself and the Josephites, and he intended to make amends. After his death, she received her habit back. Although this was an extreme case, nonetheless, the Josephites suffered an almost constant interference at the hands of the very bishops who would invite them into their diocese. The bishops seemed to think that they were free to do anything they liked with these women, irrespective of what the Josephite rule permitted or commanded. Although there were notable exceptions, generally speaking, the bishops seemed to regard the rule and the governance of the order as irrelevant details and did not hesitate to interfere in any way they saw fit. In fact, they seemed incapable, in short, of grasping that their power had any limits. As a result of all this, in 1873, Sister Mary traveled to Rome to seek the approval of the Holy See for the rule of the congregation. She was able to meet with Blessed Pius IX twice, who called her the excommunicated one, got Roman approval for the congregation and their work. The Roman authorities made some changes in the rule, and then after nearly two years, she returned with trunks of books, school supplies, and 15 Irish vocations. Immediately upon her return, she summoned a general chapter of the congregation. That's a group of sisters, a general chapter in a congregation. It's a group of people, in this case sisters, elected by other members of the congregation who gather together every six years to sort out the business of the congregation, pass rules and so forth, and also to elect their general superior. Sister Mary the Cross was elected unanimously. Mother Mary had a real job of it as a superior general. The Roman approval of the Josephite rule did little to ward off the incursions of the bishops in their attempts to unjustly control the sisters. And her vigorous defense of the rights of her sisters did not win her many fans in that category either. She had two other strikes against her. Number one is she was a colonial, born in a British colony, and having been born in Victoria. Number two, she was Scottish, uh, neither of which made many points with the Irish bishops. Her next huge class came in 1883. Once again, it was at the hand of a bishop, this time the Archbishop of Adelaide, an Irishman named Christopher Reynolds. In brief, here's the facts. In July 1883, Mother Mary received a letter signed by the Archbishop and his vicar general, which stated that under orders from the Holy See, they were going to conduct an apostolic visitation. Now, just so you know what an apostolic visitation is, there's one going on for all the active women congregations right now in America by the Holy See because they're ordered, there's an apostolic visitator sent out by the Pope to visit all these different congregations. And what they do, it's, it's conducted by the authority of the Holy See, and its purpose is to maintain faith and discipline and to correct abuses. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a paternal thing at the hand of the Holy See. Now, the fact of this visitation was no surprise or concern to Mother Mary. She'd been expecting one for some time and hoping that much good might come out of it. That was not going to be the case. During the visitation itself, the interrogations were conducted in a dishonest, deceptive uh, manner. That It's obviously designed to re- reach predetermined conclusions. The whole thing was absolutely fraudulent and disgraceful. Although she had been questioned herself, she was left completely in the dark as to the accusations which had been formulated against her. In an official letter from the archbishop, and I've read it, it's really just a torrent of unbelievable abuse and calumnies, she's accused of not being truthful, of violating holy poverty, of being disobedient, of having lost the confidence of the sisters, and so on and on and on and on. Furthermore, the archbishop removes her from jurisdiction over the sisters, orders her to leave Adelaide and go to Sydney. She quietly and obediently leaves for Sydney and was still unaware that her principal accusation was she was a helpless drunk. It gets worse. 
Although Mother Mary of the Cross and the Sisters of St. Joseph didn't realize it at the time, the letter signed by the Archbishop and the Vicar General, which had said that they had instructions from the Holy See to carry out the apostolic visitation, was completely fraudulent. They had no such authority. It was a complete lie. All a lie with the apparent goal of removing her from office and seizing control of the sisters. After she found out the archbishop had no authority from Rome for the visitation, she wrote, quote, What can the poor bishop have been thinking of? From all I can gather, our poor bishop has made a great mistake. I would rather suffer blame than reflect in the least on the bishop of Adelaide. I am confident that he meant everything for the best, and the most extraordinary evidence must have been given against me ere he could write to me as he did. Close quotes. Now, you think of the virtue of this woman. Her name's been publicly dra- dragged to the mud. She's illegally banished to another colony, removed from office, and she wonders what the poor bishop could have been thinking. He's a liar. He's lying about having a delegation from Holy See, and she's wondering what could he have been thinking. She's too nice to say the guy's a liar. It's extraordinary. It must have been a mistake. Anyway, for my money, the saddest lines about the treatment of the Josephites at the hand of the clergy at this time are found in a letter written to Mother Mary by one of the sisters left in Adelaide. The sister had been speaking with the very vicar general about how discouraging it was for her to see so many of the sisters, after so many years of hard work, being buried without a requiem mass. Close quote. I then spoke of poor Sister Magdalene, who was buried a day or two before, with apparently as little sympathy from the ecclesiastics of the diocese as if it had been a duck that died at the bottom of the yard. Close quote. That's hard for me to read. And I'd invite any brother priest that may hear this sermon uh, to offer requiem for the souls of those sisters who were denied that mercy. From her banishment in Sydney, Mother Mary of the Cross wrote to her sisters, quote, The Institute is passing through a severe trial, but with humility, charity, and truth on the part of its members, all will in the end be well. Have patience, my own loved children, Pray, pray humbly and with confidence and fear nothing. Our good God is proving his work. Close quote. And then the next blow fell. The Archbishop of Sydney was called to Rome to receive the Cardinal's hat. And on his return, told Mother Mary that she was to resign from her office as Superior General. He was to appoint a new Superior General to take her place until such time as a general chapter, which was to be held as soon as possible, could elect a new one. Mother Bernard Walsh was appointed as the interim Superior General, but a new chapter was not held to elect a new superior general. It gets worse. The next two general chapters held in 1889 and 1896 were allowed to meet, but were not allowed to elect the superior general. Instead, on each occasion, Cardinal Moran obtained the power to reappoint his candidate. All in all, Mother Bernard Walsh was reappointed as superior general for 17 years, although she died before completing her term. Father Gardner comments that because Mother Mary of the Cross's performance of her duties had irritated the bishops who wanted to impose their own ideas on the congregation, Cardinal Moran may have judged the best interest of the church in Australia would be served by this appointment. He also notes that Mother Bernard Walsh was a more pliant character. To be fair, as real words are, she was weak, yielding, and incompetent, not up to the demands of her office. And if anybody's ever been under a, a superior like that, you know what a real cross that can be. Another important factor was Mother Bernard was not Scottish. She was Irish. Now, I'm, I'm part Irish, but this over-the-top nationalism of the bishops is, is uh, just plain flat embarrassing. No, it's actually disgusting, to be honest. The machinations of the bishops continued. When the bishops of Australia and New Zealand came together for the first general synod, once again they tried to seize power over the Josephites when they voted 14 to 3, quote, with regard to the congregation which is called Sisters of St. Joseph the Sacred Heart, the bishops think faint that the convents or religious houses in each diocese should be subject to the respective ordinaries, close quote. It doesn't seem to matter what Rome says. They're bound and determined to have it their own way. These guys just did not get it. The Holy See could send out any kind of instruction it wanted, and the bishops just get selective hearing loss. Not surprisingly, this decree of the bishops was tossed out by Rome, and Rome then erected the sisters into a regular congregation having the mother house in Sydney. In August 1898, Mother Bernard died. The general chapter, held in January 1899, was finally allowed to hold elections, and in a unanimous vote, Mother Mary of the Cross was elected as Mother General. Her crosses were not over. In 1902, she suffered a stroke, left her paralyzed on her right side. Her minor speech were left intact, but she was confined to a wheelchair. In spite of infirmities, the next general chapter, 1905, the delegates once again elected her as Mother General. 
As a superior, she considered kindness the heart of the congregation, not the business matters or assignments or external matters, however important that might be. Kindness. She constantly insists on kindness and union. The sisters should bear with one another and remember the common good. She saw the duties of the superior were to study all aspects of a situation before arriving at a decision and then arrange things as well as possible and to remove annoyances, and only then could they ask their subjects to view the unavoidable problems as crosses that were actually sent by God and not there because of the superior's incompetence. She warned against murmuring and unkind gossip or becoming hard, suspicious, or critical. She pointed out that God will not ask you about those in authority, but about how you have obeyed and in what spirit to attend to that, therefore. She told her sisters not to try to do too much, but to do what they can and leave the rest to God. On August 8, 1909, she died in Sydney. She's now buried in a vault on the pistol side of the altar in the chapel at the convent. And today, just a few hours ago, this morning in Rome, the first Australian saint, Sister Mary of the Cross, was canonized. We thank God for a shining example of kindness and long-suffering. I want to close with a few, uh, consider a few lessons that we each can take from her life. How does the life of a teaching sister in Australia apply to each one of us? In the first case, just with the idea of the cross, the most difficult thing for any of us in our holy religion is to embrace our cross. By far and away, that's the most difficult thing, to learn how to suffer in a Christ-like way. For example, we can look at some of her examples in this. First, living her vows. She's keeping her vows no matter what obstacles were thrown her way. God comes first. Vows made to God must be kept. What an example for those of us in the priesthood or consecrated life, for all you that are bound by the vows of marriage. We keep our vows. We promised God we would before the altar. We keep them no matter what the obstacles. Second, her patience under unjust persecutions and crosses. If we really thought about it when we do the stations of the cross, when we get to the first station, what's the message? That we're going to be unjustly judged and persecuted. And here's a concrete example of someone following Christ in her circumstances patiently suffering these injustices and this willingness to excuse even those who are attacking her personally. And instead of responding with contempt, she responds with Christ-like charity. What an example for each of us when we're unjustly punished or attacked. Third, her shining example of how to bear with, or if needs be, even vigorously resist and battle with superiors, including priests and members of the hierarchy, while still preserving love for the church and for their office, and without losing charity in the fight. That is a difficult juggling act. What an example for those of us who've had battles, especially with priests and members of the hierarchy, over wicked priests, liturgical abuse, sex eds in the schools, bad catechesis, on and on and on. An example that even when we do these kind of things, when we have to defend these sort of uh, defend the rights of us or our children against that, have we preserved our love for the church and the office of these men without losing charity in the fight? Her humble approach to work: do what we can and leave the rest to God. Who knows that we can't do the impossible? How many people striving for perfection? I think of homeschooling mothers, especially. This is a common case. They work themselves into total frazzle trying to get everything perfect till there isn't anything left to give. We do have to work, and we have to work hard, but we also have to leave the rest to God. What an example of that. He doesn't expect impossibilities. That's his category. We just do what we can and leave the rest to him and keep our, our charity and our love for him in our hearts. Finally, for kindness. Think about this. In a world that's crying out for the love of Christ, she brought kindness, love, a smile. What an example for us. Is that the sort of thing that people would think of when they encounter us? How about when they encounter us here at Mass, when people come to join us at Mass here? If we're a Protestant or someone new and people join us at Mass here, are we reaching out with a smile and a greeting? Do they go away with an experience of kindness? Is this the kind of place they like to keep coming to? Because that's something that each one of us is responsible for. 
to have that. And everywhere we go where people look at us and say, I want to be like them because they see Christ in our life. And kindness is so powerful. You can't fake that one. Knowing our catechism is important, but it's not as important as charity. That's the one that lasts forever. And if all our knowledge doesn't get us anywhere, if it doesn't flow out into charity, we have to work on that. Always, all of us. Let us ask St. Mary the Cross to obtain for us the grace to embrace our causes, to keep our vows, no matter what obstacles might be thrown in our way, to be patient, especially when we're unjustly persecuted and attacked, preserve charity, even in the midst of combat, to do what we can, leave the rest to God, and to bring kindness wherever we go. St. Mary the Cross, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.